Hi. As I don't have my microphone or my laptop for a few days, which is where I record all my books, I thought I would use my phone and just read you some small things. So this is a book that belonged to my dad. It's called Susie Smith's Supernatural World. My dad has lots of awesome books, which I have inherited. Um, I want to read you the first story from this because it is so fun. And um, it's about a talking cat. So the book is Susie Smith's Supernatural World by the author of Prominent American Ghosts. Between these pages lurk strange tales from the world of the occult, of ghosts and poltergeists, seers and sages. If you are particularly religious and don't go for this kind of stuff, please don't watch. I, I respect your beliefs. Um, I just find this stuff really, really fun and quirky. So please feel free to skip this video if you see fit. Uh, this book is a McFadden book from 1971. We will be reading the first story, The Search for the Talking Cat. The Search for the Talking Cat. This is the story of a search that Fate magazine and this writer undertook in the year 1965. It is a strange quest for evidence of a cat that not only talks, but talks sense. And our results are inconclusive, for we have by no means proved the facts. Nevertheless, I interviewed several persons who attest that they have indeed here. Sorry, I'm really excited about this book. They have indeed heard a soft voice issue from a tomcat named Whitey, and that this voice spoke clear and sensible English. I apologize if I laugh a lot during this, because it's funny. As good a place as any to begin this account is with Patrick Kelly's column, In Our Town, published in the August 1, 1964 issue of the Tampa Tribune. It told of a talking white cat belonging to a man and wife living in Lake Hamilton, Florida. Truck going by, sorry. The source of the information was Bennett William Palmer, a retired minister who lives in Haines City, Florida. Fate published a brief resume of Kelly's report on the talking cat in Curtis Fuller's I See by the Papers column, of December 1964. Because I am writing a book about psychic animals, when I read this, I immediately wrote to Mr. Palmer for further information. Fate also made direct contact with him, and together we began to gather some fascinating information about this most unusual cat. In January 1965, Fate sent me to Florida to meet the Reverend Mr. Palmer to interview Mr. and Mrs. James Deem, Whitey's owners, and to hear the animal talk, if I should be so fortunate. I was also asked to obtain as much verification of the strange facts as I could. On Friday, January 22nd, 1965, I met the talking cat for the first time. Initially, I had gone to Haines City to pick up Mr. Palmer and we then drove until we finally located the Deem home. It is a small, extremely modest, two-room rented house, but beautifully located among huge oaks covered with Spanish moss beside one of the numerous lakes near Lake Hamilton. When I was taken inside to meet Whitey, I admit I hoped passionately he would greet me with, how do you do? But he never said a word. The large white cat looked at me steadily and seriously with his pale green eyes, but he'd never said a single word. The Deems were reticent, too, at first, but they gradually relaxed when they saw that I was perfectly willing to believe that the cat could talk. If only I might hear the truth about it. I have learned too many fantastic facts in my psychical research to close my mind to anything. However, I made it clear that evidence was of extreme importance. It was not long before Ruth Deem was telling me how it all began. 
When Whitey was a six-month-old kitten, she said, he jumped on the bed one morning and said, I'm hungry. Mrs. Deem was not asleep, but she knew she must be dreaming. I thought I was hearing things, she told me. A cat can't talk. She turned over and looked at her pet. Whitey spoke again. Mama, I'm hungry, he said. What did you say? Ruth asked. I'm hungry, Whitey replied once again. So what could she do? She got up and fed the cat, but she didn't say a word to her husband. Two or three days later, James Deem was <laughs> James Deem <laughs> was lying down when Whitey jumped up beside him. Stroking the animal, Mr. Deem said, Whitey, you're a bad cat. I am not a bad cat, replied Whitey, then added, I want to go out. James Deem shouted to his wife, Did you hear that? Yes, said Ruth, and I want to hear it again. Then she told her husband the cat had spoken a few days before, too, when she was alone. She was relieved that she now had someone with whom to share her surprise. James Deem had been a coal miner in West Virginia from the time he was nine years old until World War II. He has been retired on a disability pension since then, and he and his wife have lived in Florida for his health for the past 15 years. On June 7, 1963, when they were living in an area called Hillside Acres, Ruth heard faint meows coming from some tall grass near their home. It had been raining and the weather was so disagreeable that she asked her husband to try to find out what miserable little creature was out there, fo out there calling for help. He located the wet, bedraggled, abandoned kitten, which appeared to him to be about a month old, and brought it into the house. Ruth dried it and cleaned it and gave it some warm milk, but the little thing was very ill. After spending the next two nights sitting up with it, she and her husband finally took it to a veterinarian who managed to save its life. The kitten was named Whitey in contrast to the Deem's other cat, who epitomizes its name of Blackie. Whitey seemed perfectly normal until he spoke his first words when he was about six months old. Once he started speaking, he was rather fluent for over a year, I was told. While the more striking incidents occurred very infrequently, over a period of many months he is reported to have said some human word or sentence almost daily. I am acutely aware that such claims are difficult for the reader to accept. They are difficult for me to accept. But so are the alternatives, hoax and fraud, or simple delusion involving several different, different persons. If my account was based on the testimony of the deems alone, I would not bother to write it, for they could easily be, easily be under some misconception about their pet. However, I have talked with two of their neighbors who have signed statements that they too have heard Whitey speak. There are two other women whom I did not have the opportunity to, to meet who are said to be willing to give me their statements if I can go there at a time when they are home. As I have said, I did not hear Whitey speak. He uttered nothing more startling than meow in my presence but it was explained to me that he had been ill and had spoken almost nothing for some time, so I was not being discriminated against. I liked the cat, and he seemed to like me. At least, he endured my caresses with less disdain than cats usually show to strangers. I liked the Deems. I appreciated their initial reluctance to talk about their pet, for it showed me they are not publicity seekers. Also, I was pleased when they were willing to let me borrow the cat and keep him with me until I could hear him speak. To me, this indicates their confidence in his unusual ability, for they obviously love the animal and had no intention of letting me have him permanently. I didn't know how I could keep a sick tomcat in a hotel room or even at the home of friends, 
but I was going to make the effort. However, when Mr. Deem tried to put him into a box in my car, a wildcat fighting captivity couldn't have been more frantic, vicious, or violent. Mr. Deem managed to hold on to him, but he got badly scratched. I immediately withdrew my petition to try to handle him myself in some distant locale. Whitey calmed down quickly, however, and back in the house sat beside me on the bed as I listened to more stories about his amazing vocal feats. The deems seem quiet, pleasant, unassuming people who only desire to live quietly with their pets. Yet if it wouldn't make them too conspicuous, they do feel that others should know about Whitey's unusual talents. Unfortunately, they are not too aware of any kind of need for scientific evidence. Neither do they seem likely to show much objectivity in evaluating their experiences. I rather doubt that their neighbors who purport to have heard Whitey talk would be any different. Yet none of these people would seem to be the type to attempt a hoax. I cannot conceive that their imaginations, even collectively, could produce some of the charming stories I am about to relate. When Mrs. Deem went to the grocery, she told me, she often returned with some chocolate. Whitey is particularly fond of chocolate, and he would say, What did you bring me? She would counter with, Do you love me, Whitey? And he'd reply, I love you, Mama. What did you bring me? Once, Ruth says she heard the cat say, Come, come. She went out and saw him sitting, looking steadily at something under the house. He said, He's a big one. She stooped to see what he was looking at, and a big black snake crawled out. Mrs. Steam screamed, and then she swears. The cat said, Mama's a coward. Whitey likes to watch television, and the set often is left turned on just for his benefit. Once he saw a man shot on TV and asked, Is he hurt? Mrs. Deem said, No, he isn't hurt. Whitey then said, Mama, don't tell a lie. He also is reported to have said of a dog he saw on television, He's not real. Ruth says she thinks she once heard him say, thanks, but she is not positive of this. When Mr. and Mrs. Deem mentioned these incidents to their neighbors, they got only smiles in reply. Then they went away on a week's trip and asked Marshall Ferguson to stay in their house and take care of their cats. Mr. Ferguson is a carpenter and painter who also picks fruit when the more remunerative work is not available. He had a small house nearby. He told me, I thought Ruth Deem was having hallucinations the first time she told me about the, co the cat talking. I thought she was dreaming it up. But one day during the week that Mr. Ferguson was cat sitting, he was on the back porch. He noticed that Blackie was chasing Whitey toward the house. As Whitey ran near him, Mr. Ferguson plainly heard him cry out, Hey, Ma! <laughs> he said with a grin, I very flatly told him Ma wasn't home. I know he understood. Prior to that, I thought she was loose upstairs. And he nodded toward Ruth Deem. About a week after the Deems returned from their trip, Marshall Ferguson dropped in one morning and was having a cup of tea a cup of coffee in the kitchen. Whitey was in the bedroom with Ruth. Mama, he hit me, he said. Who hit you, she asked. Him, Whitey said, apparently referring to Mr. Ferguson, whose voice could be heard from the kitchen. What did he hit you with, honey? Newspaper, answered the cat. <laughs> Ruth went out into the kitchen and asked Ferguson if he'd had any trouble with the cats while they were gone. Not too much, he replied. Did you have to hit Whitey? He thought a moment. Once, he said, recalling that Whitey and Blackie had been fighting and he had struck at them to stop them. Blackie immediately had jumped down and run under something. Whitey had sat where he was and stared with those pale green eyes. Did you hit them with a newspaper? Ruth continued. 
Yes, with a rolled-up newspaper, said Marshall Ferguson. And then he did a double take, wondering how she knew about it. He remarked to me, There is only one way she could have known. That darn cat told her. About this time, another incident allegedly involving Whitey occurred. Whitey was at a hospital because of infections he got in a cat fight. From his cage, he said to the veterinarian's helper, I want to go home. The helper looked around and saw no one anywhere near except the cat. He rushed to his employer with what he had heard, but was charged with trying to fool somebody. The doctor then went to the cage and looked at the cat, who didn't say a word. However, as he turned to go away, the doctor also heard the words, I want to go home. He looked accusingly at his helper, who maintained, The cat said that. I could not verify this story. It seems that if a veterinarian actually heard a cat speak, he should be willing to admit it, and, in fact, to publicize it to the ends of the earth. I am told, however, that the vet in question is afraid of bad publicity and so, so will not allow his name to be mentioned. I have made every effort to learn who this doctor is and have gotten nowhere. Mrs. Deem says he has sworn her to secrecy. This is the one tale about Whitey that I offer only with reservations. Eventually, news of the talking cat began to spread. A reporter from the Lakeland Ledger interviewed the Deems and wrote a story about Whitey, who would not talk for him either. Soon there were brief accounts in several Florida papers. None of the photographs taken came out well. But after the Ledger photographer left, Whitey uttered the word light, referring evidently to his flashbulbs. After this newspaper publicity, People began to spy on the cat and its owners, sometimes in a very rude fashion. Hillside Acres is a housing development on the side of a lake near the town of Lake Hamilton. Some distance away, in the midst of large orange groves, is the settlement of trailers and plain little hollow tile houses where the Deems lived. People began to travel the dirt back roads to track them down. Once, someone even stuck a camera in the window and took a picture of the cat inside its home. The Deems decided to move to Winter Haven to get away from the sensation seekers. There, a traveling preacher sought them out because of his curiosity about the cat. The Deems are deeply religious people and invited him in. After some conversation, they were startled to hear Whitey say to the preacher, why don't you go home? And they were horrified when he added, He's a stinker. Mrs. Dean quickly said, Aren't you ashamed of yourself? But Whitey stoutly denied it. I am not, he said. I never learned the name of this visiting preacher, but even if I had, it seems doubtful that he would like to have it published under the circumstances. Another story which sounds too good to be true, which cannot be verified, and which stands on the word of the Deems alone, occurred when they made a trip to North Carolina. They naturally find it difficult to get accommodations when traveling with two large tomcats. That's why they leave them at home whenever possible. When they do take them, however, Mrs. Deems says of motel owners, if they don't want my cats, they don't want me. So this was not the first time they had slept in their automobile. In a small town in North Carolina, they were parked alongside the curb, sound asleep, when a passing policeman heard a voice from the car cry, Help! Help! He rushed up and flashed his light inside. What he saw besides a couple of sleepy people was a large, beautiful white cat, who now spoke to him calmly and distinctly. I want out, please, it said. What the policeman felt when the cat added, No one loves me, is not known. This is typical of the put-upon attitude Whitey so frequently indicated in his statements. But his actions bespeak a different attitude. When one considers the claims for a talking cat, 
one must consider not only what he says, but the cat himself. If he is said to have a human-like vocabulary, one half expects him also to act in a human manner. Whitey, however, is all tomcat, and an excessively stubborn tomcat at that. His very tomcattiness is one reason the story has been so difficult to research. If he had stayed home and watched television nights, he wouldn't have had so much trouble, and probably wouldn't have lost his voice. But this cat prowls and fights. During the years that I have known about him, he has been stolen, lost, poisoned, and hospitalized almost more than he has been at home. Shortly after the North Carolina trip, Whitey was stolen from the porch of his Winter Haven home. He was gone for 27 days, but eventually turned up back at Hillside Acres. He was in very poor condition and even had a mark on him which the deems think indicate he was shot at. Whitey and his family now live about four miles from Hillside Acres, but the cat continues to return there whenever he gets away from home. Since he is so clamorous and forceful in his demands, James Deem eventually will relent <laughs> sorry, and let him out even though he knows Whitey will run away. <laughs> Shortly before Christmas, 1964, on one of his sojourns, he was poisoned and was very ill when found. He still was not feeling well when I saw him, and the doctor this time said he may never fully recuperate. It was this spell which made him stop talking. However, one of the best instances of his speaking has occurred since this time. Joe Rhodes, a contractor who has trucks for picking citrus fruit, lives in a trailer at Hillside Acres with his wife and children. One afternoon in late December, he noticed Whitey in a vacant lot nearby. He thought, that cat's run away from home again, and he started toward Whitey in order to retrieve him. This was between four and five o'clock on a clear day, and the visibility was good. There was nobody else anywhere around. As he walked slowly toward Whitey, he distinctly heard the cat say, You can't catch me. Mr. Rhodes is a very quiet and retiring man. He appears to have no possible interest in publicity or the limelight. Neither did any of the other people I talked to about this cat. I have only their testimony, however. Whitey was not a witness in his own defense. I discussed this case with the late well-known parapsychologist, Dr. Hornell Hart, professor of sociology at Florida Southern College, Lakeland, Florida. Professor Hart said, I should entertain as my primary hypothesis that the alleged remarks by the cat could be explained under three main categories. One, ventriloquism. Two, sincere misinterpretation of a normal cat's mewings and meows. And three, the development of a fad under which it became stylish for individuals to report having heard the cat make various remarks. I know of no psychical phenomena which create any plausible precedent for expecting a cat to make intelligible vocal sounds conveying conversational meaning. I doubt very much whether the structure of the cat's vocal cords and mouth would permit any such thing. Now, as just noted, if we accept Mr. Rhodes' testimony, we have removed the charge of ventriloquism. Second, nothing Whitey has been reported as saying has sounded like a meow, unless I want out can be so interpreted. As for Dr. Hart's third suggestion, perhaps this is the true answer. I only reiterate that these people who testified did not act or sound as if they were indulging in a fad or a game of any kind. There are always those persons who will suggest a supernormal, supernormal explanation. The Reverend Bennett William Palmer, for instance, disagrees entirely with Professor Hart. Mr. Palmer never has heard Whitey talk, 
but he believes implicitly in the veracity and objectivity of the deems. To him, this cat is the most remarkable cat in the history of the world. The Reverend Mr. Palmer says he entered the picture in June 1963, when he invested some money in lots in Hillside Acres, and there met the deems. It was probably six months later, he said, that I first heard mention of the talking cat. After that, he began to collect stories about Whitey and to send out reports to newspapers and magazines. Mr. Palmer may be fairly close to the mark when he compares Whitey to the talking mongoose on the Isle of Man. This story is well known to all psychical researchers. In a house there at Cashin's Gap, a disembodied voice was heard frequently over a period of years. It called itself Geff and said it was a talking mongoose. However, Dr. Nandor Fodor, who spent a week on the Isle of Man cross-questioning witnesses but did not see any of the phenomena himself, concluded that Geff was a poltergeist-like manifestation. At first glance, it seems a far cry from an alleged talking mongoose on the Isle of Man to an alleged talking cat in Florida. But animals with such unusual talents have to be explained some way unless human testimony is dismissed entirely. The remarks of both animals resemble what one might expect from an unhappy and insecure child. And it is just such infantilism that some theorists associate with poltergeist activity. If one subjects Whitey's supposed conversation to psychological scrutiny, it seems at times almost embarrassingly human and Freudian. Here is a cat that apparently was abandoned to die when it was a kitten. Today, even though rescued and loved by the Deems, it still is reported to complain that no one loves me. It most frequently uses her human words of love and rejection. Hungry, mad, I want to go home, he's bad, often said about Blackie. Love, I love Mama, and why no one love me? It also has been suggested that perhaps Whitey, in Whitey we have evidence of the transmigration of a human soul into a cat's body, but in this case, one wonders why its conversation should be limited to Whitey's ordinary experience and to a childlike vocabulary. But all this is pure speculation in an era when few persons credit the existence of poltergeists or talking cats. Obviously, this case needs long and detailed investigation. Just as I was finishing this article, word arrived that Whitey had started talking again. He said to Mr. Deem, come on, when he wanted to go for a walk. And he said to Mrs. Deem, in front of Mrs. Sharon, a neighbor in Hillside Acres, Mama, I want out. The consensus of opinion at Lake Hamilton is that I should come on down to Florida again to hear the cat now that he has resumed talking. That's the consensus of opinion right here, too. First published in Fate, November 1965. In the years since then, Whitey has done less and less talking. It is probably too late now ever to prove anything about the unusual talents of this amazing animal.